And we're going to be looking at the rest of John chapter 16. We are finishing John 16 um, this morning. Um, growing up, kids play lots of different games, um, but one of my favorite games that we used to play growing up is The Floor is Lava, right? How many of you grew up playing that? Not a, I feel sad. What a terrible childhood. It's the greatest game as a kid, and it's the game that now as a, I'm a parent, I hate the most because I'm like, don't jump on the couch, right? And so if you don't know, you just basically say, okay, three, two, one, the floor is lava, and now you got to jump from the couch to the chair and up onto the island and then swing on the pose, and, and you just have to get to different places without touching the ground. Well, there's a show on Netflix now. They've created a game show based on this kid's game, and the show is called The Floor is Lava. And so they, in an old abandoned Ikea warehouse, they turned it into all these different levels, and you have to jump to different things. And, and they made this slime stuff that looks like lava, and then if contestants fall in, oh no, they fell into the lava. And so our, our family has watched a few episodes um, of this show, and then always right after, it's like, can we play that game now? And so one of the times, my son Oliver, he's three, but he kind of pushed the, the little chest that we have in the basement close to the couch, and there was probably a two-foot gap, and he would jump from the chest to the couch like he was jumping over uh, the lava, and I was just kind of watching him, and, and one of the times, he stood on the, the edge of the chest, and I could hear him talking to himself, and he said, got to be brave, got to be brave, and then, he, and then he jumped, and it just made me laugh, um, this little three-year-old like psyching himself up, mustering up the courage and the bravery to jump, and it just made me think, I mean, we, we do that even as adults sometimes, don't we? we? We get into situations where we need courage, and we need bravery, and we need you know, strength to get through. And I don't know if you necessarily talk to yourself like that, but it's like we have to kind of muster up some courage and bravery for whatever the, the trial is that we're going through. Um, Jesus, in the Upper Room Discourse, he's been teaching his disciples for a few chapters. And I love, to, like today we're going to finish the Upper Room Discourse. And next week is the high priestly prayer, this last long prayer that Jesus praise to God the Father, but it's amazing how Jesus begins and ends his teaching to his disciples, and it's centered around exactly that. How do you and I have courage and bravery to, to keep going, to remain faithful? So even in John 14, 1, as Jesus begins teaching his disciples, this is how he starts. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God Believe also in me. And then in our, our passage today, at the very end of chapter 16, this is how Jesus ends his last teaching to his disciples, take heart, I have overcome the world. So he begins and ends the teaching to his disciples, this last teaching with essentially the same message. Hey, disciples, take heart, be courageous, be brave. Now, I think this is really timely because we live in a world that, and it's not new, but it, our world is obsessed with, and it feels like it's run by just fear of the next thing. I mean, we're afraid of everything in our world. And if you watch the news, you are just fed the next things that you should be afraid of, right? You don't turn on the news and hear like, here's all the greatest stories of all the nicest things that took place in the world today. You turn on the news and it's like, well, whether it was COVID or now there's a new war or now there's a famine or now there's an inflation and now everyone is bankrupt, we're all going to die. That's just constantly fed to us. Here are the next things that you should be afraid of. And I love that as Jesus is leaving, he has been very honest with his disciples. He says, you're going to be hated. You're going to face persecution. You might get kicked out of the synagogues. You're going to be dragged away. And I can guarantee you, because all the disciples were humans like us, they were probably filled with fear, going, this doesn't sound great. I don't want to go through this kind of stuff. And so it's important, like you and I, as, as we are awaiting the return of Jesus, his second coming, we need the same thing that the disciples said, or that Jesus said to the disciples. You and I need to take heart. We need to be courageous if we're going to be faithful till 
the end. So what I want to do this morning is read the passage, read John 16, 16 through 33. Um, explain why uh, the disciples had some confusion about what Jesus was saying, and then basically four ways that you and I take heart as we follow Jesus. So John 16, we'll start reading in verse 16. Jesus says this, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and you do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The reading of God's word. So right away, and we're not going to necessarily go through this passage, you know, chronologically. We'll jump around a bit. But right away, you can probably see some of the disciples' confusion from Jesus' words. There's this, it's repeated quite a bit. Jesus says, you know, in a little while you'll see me, then a little while. And then they go, what does he mean by a little while and then a little while? And then Jesus says, are you asking me about a little while? And you're like, okay, what is happening here? And so there's all this back and forth, Right. So Jesus, this is why they're so confused. This is what he says in verse 16. A little while, you won't see me. And then a little while, and you will see me. And we're told in verses 17 and 18, the disciples are really confused. What does Jesus mean by a little while? And and, and they're discussing amongst themselves, right? And it's like they're trying to figure it out. We have no idea what he's talking about. And then in verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, is this what you want to ask me? Like, it sounds like you want to ask me what I mean by a a little while. And then he he doesn't really clear up the confusion. confusion. He just says, well, you're going to weep and lament, and the world will rejoice. You're going to be sorrowful, but then your sorrow will turn to joy. So what is Jesus talking about? Um, I believe that he's talking about his his impending death and, and resurrection. He says, in just a little while, you will see me no longer, meaning in just a little while, I am going to be arrested, crucified, and buried. And what's going to happen during that time? Well, you disciples, you're going to weep while the evil world rejoices, while the religious leaders in the world says, yes, we killed Jesus, we got rid of him. While that's happening, his disciples are going to be filled with sorrow and they're going to weep, but then, Jesus says, then your sorrow will turn to joy. You'll see me again, right, when he is raised from the dead. So as we read it, it, it might make a little bit more sense to us. We go, okay, yeah, a little while, Jesus is going to be crucified and buried. The disciples won't see him. And then there's a little while, three days, and then he's raised from the dead, and then they'll rejoice. 
Why is that so hard to understand, disciples? Here's why. Jesus had just said in verse 10, if you, you know, put your eyes a little bit uh, farther up in the, in the passage, in verse 10, he said this, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. So Jesus had just told his disciples, you're not going to see me anymore. And now he says, well, in a little while, you won't see me. And then in a little while, you will see me. And so I'm sure they're going, but wait, Jesus, you just told us we're not going to see you anymore. Here's why there's so much confusion. Remember, all of the disciples are Jewish men. And in Jewish theology and in their understanding of the Messiah, they had no category for a Messiah who would come who would be arrested and crucified, who would die, who would be buried, who would rise from the dead, who would return to heaven, who then would send another counselor, the Holy Spirit, and then return again one day. They had no category for that. In their theology, the Messiah came once, and he just wiped out their enemies, and then he rules in Israel and sets up Israel as a nation again. Even Jesus later in verse 25, he says, I've said these things to you in figures of speech, but the hour is coming when I'll tell you plainly. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes, right? Remember, the Holy Spirit's going to bring to mind everything that Jesus taught you. And even in verse 28, he says, I came from the Father, I've come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and I'm going to the Father, right? So, So in our mind, that makes sense, but try and put yourself as a Jewish man who had no concept of what Jesus is talking about. That's why I love that in verse 29 and 30, the disciples go, oh, now we get it. I really don't think they did. Ah, okay, now, Jesus, we know what you mean. And they said, well, that's, you know, you've, uh, let's just read it. When they, when they say, now we know, you know all things, you don't need anyone to question you. That's why we believe that you came from God. So I really doubt that they understood fully, and that's why Jesus responds the way he does. He goes, oh, you have to read it as there's a hint of um, sarcasm in the original. Oh, now you guys believe. Oh, right? Jesus is going, no, you don't. Why? Because in a little bit, you're all going to abandon me. You're all going to scatter. You're all going to go to your own homes. You don't really understand what I'm getting at, disciples. So what we're seeing, and it's really fascinating, we're seeing Jewish disciples trying to wrap their minds around who Jesus is and what he came to do, and we're going to see that they're not going to fully understand until the Holy Spirit is sent, and then it's almost like, okay, now we, we get what Jesus was talking about. So here's what's profound about Jesus, his closing words. The closing statement that Jesus gives his disciples is he says, I've said these things to you verse 33, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So on one hand, you and I as disciples of Jesus, as followers of him, we are promised tribulation. We're promised it. He says, in this world you will have tribulation. And the Greek word for tribulation is thlipsis, and it means a few different things. It means persecution, affliction, distress. Um, If you look up a a Greek lexicon, which is essentially a a book that lists all the Greek words, and this is kind of what it means, and this is in um, how it was used. Uh, The word thlipsis for tribulation, it means pressure. It means what constricts or, or rubs together. Um, It's used to describe a narrow place that hems something in. So let me let me give you an illustration. Um, A few years ago, we went to visit our uh, my wife's family in Idaho, and my brother-in-law and I and his daughter went uh, to explore a cave. So it was it was fascinating. It was like you drive uh, out into the middle of nowhere, and then you drive on a dirt road, and then it looked like we were just driving into the middle of a field. And then there was literally a hole with a ladder that went down, and you could go and just climb down the ladder. And then it was like the the initial cave was probably as big as this 
room and you could like, like explore. And then as you went further and further into the cave, the cave became smaller and smaller and smaller. And at one point, you know, we were started by walking around like this and then you're kind of walking around like this. And then at one point, you're actually on your hands and knees and the cave is just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And finally, I was like, I got to get out of here. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm getting very claustrophobic. That's what, if you can picture, that's what the word flipsies means. It's this idea of pressure kind of coming down on you. You are now hemmed in. You have nowhere to go. It's like this feeling of, I am now boxed in. That's what Jesus use, uses for the word tribulation. And I, I know that you, it's a great word because you felt that. I know you have. When you go through distress and it's like, I feel like the world is kind of caving in on me. I'm, I have nowhere to go. So Jesus says part of the Christian walk is you're going to face that. You will face tribulations in this world. I mean, even in 1 Thessalonians 3.3, the Apostle Paul says this, no one, that no one be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we're destined for this. Like Paul says, Christian, you are destined for tribulation, for affliction. So Jesus says to his disciples, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to feel sometimes like it's caving in around you. But take heart. And this, that, that phrase is one word in, in Greek, take heart. And it literally means be courageous. Be bold. Um, in that same Greek lexicon, if you look up this word, it means unflinching courage to radiate warm confidence. Like unflinching courage. The walls are caving in around me. I'm not even flinching about it. Unflinching courage. Jesus says, take heart. Now, that word is used seven times in the New Testament. And here's what's amazing. Every single time that word is used, it is spoken by Jesus and Jesus alone. No one else in, the, in, in the, the New Testament tells someone else to take heart besides Jesus. Now, why, why is that significant? It matters. Because if you come to me, for instance, or you go to your spouse, or you go to someone that you trust, when you are going through, right, tribulation, and, and the walls are caving in, and you go to someone, and they say, well, take heart, you'll go, thanks. That's great. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Why? Because they're just another human being. But when Jesus, the creator, sustainer, Lord of the universe, tells his followers, hey, take heart. It, it means much more, doesn't it? Like Jesus is the one who created and he's in control of everything. And so when he tells you, yeah, I know the walls are caving in, but take heart. Be of good courage unflinching bravery, it, it means something way different than if it's just me telling you that. So Jesus tells his disciples, you're going to have tribulation, but take heart, have courage. And I, I believe that there's four reasons that you and I can take heart found in our passage, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of the, the crushing pressure, which can we just be honest, like you're either going through that right now or you have gone through it, or you will go through it. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is your destiny, to go through tribulation. So how do you and I then take heart? How do we, right, if I'm standing on the edge of the chest, jumping to the couch going, got to be brave. How do you and I do, is it just, is this a, just a pep talk that we give ourselves, or, or how do we actually take heart? So four ways, if you take notes, here's the first. We take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. I mean, he, he kind of, that's a given, right? He says that in the very last verse. Take heart, I have overcome the world. So how did Jesus overcome the world? And we've seen it throughout his ministry, if you've read the Gospels. He overcame the world by, by resisting Satan in the wilderness, by healing people, by casting out demons. It's like as he lived and, and walked and did ministry, like nothing could stop him. Right? He, he was overcoming sickness and disease and demonic oppression. He, he 
overcame the world, but ultimately, how did Jesus overcome the world? It was through his death and resurrection that he conquered. Like the world tried to kill Jesus, tried to silence him, tried to punish him, and he walked out of the tomb. That's why the physical resurrection of Jesus is so important. It proves that Jesus is who he says he is. He has all authority that he claimed because not even death and sin had any hold on him. They've been defeated, right? Even in in the book of Revelation, in, in Revelation 5, the angel tells John, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, that's Jesus, he's conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Later in Revelation 17, they will make war on the lamb, Jesus, and the lamb will conquer them. Why? Because he's king of kings and lord of lords, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. I mean, the resurrection of Jesus is massive because it was him saying, the world threw everything it had at me, and I took it, and then I walked out of the tomb. Right? Amen. Like, that's, Jesus overcame. And then it's amazing. So you and I, as followers of Jesus, we're told in Scripture that we overcome not because we're special, not because we are strong in, in and of our, ourselves. We take heart and we're courageous and we overcome because Jesus has already overcome, right? First John 4.4, 4, John says, little children, you are from God and have overcome come them for he who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. So when the world just crushes you and it feels like it's closing in, John says, you've, you've overcome little children. Why? Because Jesus overcame, right? Later on in in 1 John 5, everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, right? So we have to remind ourselves that when we are faced with tribulation and pain and suffering and trials and it just feels like it's crushing, we have to remember, yes, Jesus has already overcome the world. I can have unflinching courage because I know that Jesus is alive. He's not dead in the tomb. He walked out. He is living. Secondly, you can take heart because joy will overshadow your grief. Um, In verse 20, uh, Jesus says that his disciples are going to weep and lament, and the world, the evil world, is going to be rejoicing but, Jesus says, your sorrow is going to turn to joy, right? And, and then later on, it, it's, it's in verse 22, you have sorrow now, but your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. And I love the example that Jesus gives because it's very, very practical. He says, like, consider this, this little parable in verse 21. He says, when a woman's giving birth, um, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when the baby's delivered... She no longer remembers the anguish because a human being has been born. Now, I know some of the ladies in the room were like, oh, I remember the anguish. (laughs) So I don't think Jesus is saying, like, literally, you will not remember the pain you went through. That's not what he's saying because I know many of you, you remember, man, that was the most pain I've ever been through. I mean, like, my hand, when Molly squeezed my hand, is the most pain I've ever been through. I remember it, right? <laughs> but, like, so, for instance, I, uh, I was there for all three of our kids' births, and it was painful. And there was always one point where my wife was just like, ah, I don't think I can do this. It's too painful. But then once the baby comes, you just go, totally worth it. Look at this little human being. Right? And then I know that, that women, that you, you don't hold on to the pain because lots of you go, let's do that again. Crazy, right? But you go, the joy of having a newborn baby on my chest, man, that outweighs any pain that I just went through. So, I mean, Jesus is right. And so he says, you are going to go through sorrow and pain, but your joy will overshadow your grief. It just... It will. No one will take your joy from you. The the disciples are going to have sorrow when Jesus dies, but joy will replace that when he's raised from the dead. And so the reality for you and I as we wait for the return of Jesus 
it's like this paradox almost that, that grief and joy just kind of exist alongside each other. I mean, I'm just even, I'm even marveling at God's timing. As a church, we've suffered this week, losing two godly men. And you want to talk about grief accompanied with joy? I mean, it just feels like those two things can't go together. But Jesus, they, they do, though. And yet the promise is, Jesus says, your joy, it will overshadow your grief. No one will be able to take your joy from you. Um, even in Romans 8, Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Like Paul says, you're going to suffer, but it's not even close to the joy and the glory that is coming. Um, he, he says more in 2 Corinthians 4, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are, are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. If you know what Paul went through, and for him to say, it's just this light momentary affliction, you're like, really, Paul? Like, 39 lashes several times, being shipwrecked, being stoned almost to death. And he goes, listen, it's not even worth comparing to what's coming. Your joy is going to overshadow your grief. Because Jesus has overcome, because the resurrection happened, because Jesus is coming back, because eternity is real, our joy will far outweigh our grief. In the here and now even, but especially when Jesus returns. And so because of that, you and I, we can take heart. We can have unflinching courage. We can say, I know that even though I feel like the walls are caving in and there's pressure, I can take heart because I know what's coming. And that joy is going to far surpass anything that the world can throw at me. Thirdly, you and I can take heart because we have access to God through prayer. In verse 23, Jesus says, truly, truly, whatever you ask my Father in my name, he will give it to you. And then in verse 24, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Like Jesus says, you can ask the Father directly. Whatever you ask, he'll give it to you. And I don't need to, to beat a dead horse, but obviously this does not mean, hey God, can I have a million dollars? Hey, God, I want a bigger house. Hey, God, I want a fancy car. That is such a poor way to translate this verse. Jesus is talking about when we go through pain and suffering and hardship, you can ask God for whatever you want and he'll give it to you. So I don't know, asking God, God, would you give me courage? God, would you walk through this pain with me? Jesus says, you ask that for my father, he'll do it for you. So when you and I go through tribulation and pressure and pain, we go to God in prayer, and we go in the name of Jesus. Now, again, this doesn't mean that it's some kind of clever trick that as long as you add in Jesus' name to the end of every prayer, it's like, oh, okay, God, now, now God has to give you what you want. Praying in the name of Jesus means I'm going to pray in a way that is consistent with the character and will of Jesus, and I'm coming to God in the authority of Jesus. I'm praying in his name. He's my king. I'm going to pray the way that Jesus would pray. And Jesus says, ask and you will receive. So when you ask for strength or wisdom or perseverance or a way out even, God answers you. So take heart. Be of good courage. He has not left you alone. You can approach the God of the universe directly and ask for help. And I know so many of you, because I, I do this too, like when you go through the crushing pressure and the pain, it's like all you can do is just, Jesus, help me. Sometimes you can't even get that out. You just go, oh, God. And we're told that he listens. You can approach him. So take heart. Lastly, you and I can take heart and have courage because God the Father loves you. 
In verses 26 and 27, Jesus says, In that day you'll ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Isn't that amazing? Jesus says that on that day you're going to ask in my name, and actually, like, it's, it's not as if I have to then, okay, hold on, I'll go talk to God about that, because he doesn't listen to you you know, peons down here. He only, Jesus says, he listens to you. Why? Because the Father himself loves you. Why does God the Father love us? Because we've loved Jesus and believed in him. Like, I think sometimes we underestimate how amazing it is that God the Father loves us. We go, yep, we know. God loves me. We say that to each other, hey, well, don't worry, God loves you. And we go, yep, I know that. And we all know it up here. But I think sometimes we don't fully get how unbelievable this is, that God the Father loves you. And many of us, and I I know this is true because I talk to lots of you, you believe this view of God where, yeah, yeah, sure, he loves me, but he is just constantly disappointed in me. It's like God is up there and his arms are crossed and he's just mad at me. Right, And you just have this view of God that he's just an angry dad. That you just kind of have to tiptoe around and you don't want to tick God the Father off. And so just kind of do your own thing. And, and no, that is such a wrong view of God the Father. I mean, he loves you. I mean, Romans 5.8, God shows his love for you. For us, in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Do you want to know how much God the Father loves you? That while you were his enemy and spitting in his face and wanting nothing to do with uh, him, that he looked at you and said, I'm going to give everything to purchase that person. I'm going to give my own son so that that person, you, can be in my family. Um, Even 1 John 4, in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. How do you know that God loves you? I mean, his son was nailed to a cross for you. Even in Zephaniah 3, it says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He'll rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He'll exalt over you with loud singing. See, again, I think we have this view of God that he's just kind of disappointed. And when we all get to heaven, he's going to look out over us and just go like, well, given what I had to work with, I guess these are my kids. No, I mean, he's, he's, he goes, this is my family. I love my kids. He's rejoicing over you. I mean, God loves you. So take heart. Be of good courage. The only true God loves you. I think sometimes we don't do this, right, when we feel the crushing pressure and we feel the the tribulation and the pain. Oftentimes we just spiral or we panic or we lose our way because I think we forget these things. That we don't take heart. I know a lot of us, when we, when we have tribulation, we lose heart. We just go, my world's falling apart. What is happening? God, where are you? Why are you allowing this? I can't trust you. Because I think we forget these things. We forget, right, I can take heart because Jesus, he's overcome the whole world. I can take heart because I know that my joy will overshadow the grief that I'm feeling. I can take heart because I know that I can go to God my Father and ask, and He'll give me what I need. I can take heart because I know that God the Father, He's not disappointed in me. He loves me because of Jesus. So on, on one hand, I love that Jesus doesn't mince words with us. He, I mean, He tells the truth to us. He says, it's a guarantee. If you're going to follow me, you will face hard things. Persecution, hatred, suffering, pain, tribulation. You're going to feel right in the cave like the walls are just kind of closing in. He, sa- he, sa- he promises that. Yet, Jesus says, in the midst of that, it's like he said, my, my children, my father, 
in the midst of that, take heart. Be courageous. Be unflinching in your courage. And I know that we go, but Jesus, you just don't get it. You don't know what I'm going through. It's too hard. And it's like he says, no, no, no. Take heart. I've overcome the world. No one's going to take your joy from you. You have access to God through prayer, and my Father loves you. Take heart. Be of good courage. So, Father, I just thank you for such an encouraging passage of Scripture. And, God, I'm blown away by your timing again and again and again because um, many of us are, are, are feeling grief and pain. But in reality, God, we can preach this message every week because just give it enough time and all of us will go through pain and tribulation. When when it feels like the world's kind of caving in on us, where the cave is getting smaller and smaller and we just go, man, I just feel all this pressure. And so, God, I just thank you that in the midst of that, um, Jesus, you told your disciples Yes, that's going to happen, but take heart. Be of good courage. Be unflinching in your courage. And he didn't say that so that, you, that, that we would try and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, right? We're not standing on the edge of the chest trying to talk ourselves into it. Yeah, got to be brave. Got to be brave. Gotta. No, you told us that because you have overcome the world, Jesus. You promised that no one would take our joy from us. That all of the grief that we experience in life is so small compared to the joy that is coming in eternity. That we have access to you, God, through prayer. That we can ask and you'll answer us. And that ultimately we can take courage because we serve a God who doesn't just put up with us, but that deeply, deeply loves us. So God, I pray for my brothers and sisters um, who, who are going through the pressure, who are going through pain and tribulation, who just feel the weight of it. Oh God, I pray that they would take heart. Not because they can be strong enough, but they would take heart because Jesus, you've overcome. So thank you that you walk with us through trial and pain And that you listen, that you turn your ear towards us, that you care about what we go through. And God, I pray that we would just cling on to these truths, repeat them to ourselves as we face pain and tribulation, and that all of us would take heart. And so we just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.